Hello and welcome to this week's instalment of Nicholas Investment Insights. This week we put the global COVID vaccine effort under the microscope. As a magnified second waves of the virus began to falter even the most optimistic minds in mid-2020, the surprisingly speedy development and readiness of global COVID vaccines announced boosted confidence on both Wall Street and Main Street. In the UK, the arrival of the cavalry in the form of the Pfizer and BioNTech uh, and the Oxford and AstraZeneca vaccines has up upended many a calculus over which companies will pull out of the COVID-19 quagmire the fastest. There's also a significant milestone looming in the US, with half of all adult Americans targeted to have had at least one jab any day now. Other global winners in the vaccine rollout race are Israel, the United Arab Emirates and Chile, all of whom have offered at least one dose to more than one third of their populations. Locally, our own federal government is currently under fire for a slow and troubled rollout that has seen it dub, dump its goal of having everyone receive at least one jab by October, and uncertainties have prevented any new deadlines being set. But vaccination efforts have not been without their own problems with serious side effects emerging from several of the major vaccines, which is in turn hampering widespread delivery and destroying fragile public confidence in getting the jab. So now the question remains, will these servicing vaccine issues manage to infect the current elevated confidence in global stock markets and what steps can be taken to protect investment portfolios? So joining us today we, to share his thoughts on immunising against wobbly vaccinations and their relevant impacts on our portfolios, we have Nicholas Wells, Head of Investments, Damien Classen. Hello to you, Damien. Hi, Tim. We also have, sitting across from Damien, we're lucky to be joined by our Chief Strategist, David Llewellyn-Smith. Hello, David. Thanks, Tim. And uh, finally, on the line and making his debut on Nicholas Investment Insights, we have our own senior analyst, Radik Zeleny. Hello over to you, Radik. Hi, Tim. Wonderful. And just a quick reminder that before we get started, uh, and if you haven't already, subscribe and click on the notification bell to be notified of when we go live or have a new webinar to watch or follow us on your preferred podcast platform. We also ask if you'd like to take a moment to click like on the video now to help our show grow. And for all those listening in live, feel free to drop in your questions in the YouTube live stream chat to have them answered along the way. So we've got a big, big show today, plenty of people, full house, so looking forward to it. Let's jump into the agenda. Uh, so we're going to kick off with uh, some background on the vaccines uh, and then a roll into a series of investment effects. So uh, investment effects of a slower or slow vaccine rollout, uh, the investment effect of the Sinovac problems as well. Uh, once again, investment effects of uneven economic growth and emerging market debt. Uh, and then the final effect on value versus quality versus growth. And I guess then wrapping up in our investment outlooks as well at the end of the show as we do. I've got a sneaking suspicion this is going to be a show on investment outlooks, though. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and I think I'll probably I'll, I'll, I'll say that right up front for anyone. You know, we're, we're not trying to do a biology lesson. We, yep. we want to do a bit of a background, which is why we've got Radic uh, on board. Radic uh, you know, had a, a long history um, uh, as an analyst in in the health sector and and looking at um, at, at the companies within it, so we thought it was you know good good chance for him to to jump on. Um, but we really did want to focus for most of this on the investment effects because um, yeah, there's plenty of other places you can you can get the information on the background of the the virus. We're we're more interested in what does it actually mean for for markets. Absolutely, and, and just sort of role playing a few different scenarios because a lot of this is uncertain. And yep. it's just saying, well, if if this type of thing happens, then here's what the outcomes are. If something else happens, what you know, what does it mean? Sure. Okay. Very good. Uh, so shall we get into it? How they work? Okay. So that's my cue. Thanks, Tim. Um, just as a bit of background, uh, while I ended up in finance, I actually started in science and have a degree in uh, molecular biology. So. I guess in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So I've got the uh, how they work um, job. So I'm, I'm going hoping, to the first I'm slide. We're not the blind over here, you know. Anyway, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the uh, thanks for the input. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. <laughs> okay, well, uh, just briefly, mine's a uh, picture heavy, but I'll just sort of run through it. So on the how they work slide, essentially there are four different types of vaccines that are on the market at the moment. And um, the traditional one, I guess, is the one in there in the middle. It looks like an amoeba. That's actually the in inactivated or weakened virus. That's, a, that's essentially the historical methodology where you get a virus and you basically um, make it non-active, put it into the body, and it elicits a response. So that's how we sort of 
defeated polio and a lot of the diphtheria and a lot of those sort of um, uh, diseases. The uh, other second most common one is the other one with the black arrow there. That's the viral vector one. That's basically where you put in a, a bit of DNA into a innocuous uh, vector and the body creates the viruses and creates a response. The two new methods, I guess, that have, have emerged is um, the protein-based vaccine, which is where you find a, a protein on the, on, the vet, on the virus which you can uh, reproduce, introduce into the body and you get a reaction. And lastly, and the most controversial, is the messenger RNA one, uh, which is where you actually alter a person's DNA or messenger RNA, which is what mRNA stands for, and you produce um, antigens which the body then reacts to. So going to the next slide, we can then look at the various ones that exist. So the, the messenger RNA ones, uh, the, they were the first ones out, and they're very... Uh, quick to produce. So they were the first ones that were produced and came out in November were Pfizer and Moderna. And, and so when uh, you say that, right, quick quick to produce but slow to scale up, is, is that, am I right in that? Um, yes, because uh, you need a certain amount of technology to be able to create it. For instance, Australia doesn't have the technology to scale up the messenger RNA vaccines, but we can do the uh, traditional vaccines here. So a lot of countries probably can't scale it up. And um, there's also that problem of the storage, which I guess everyone knows about and the issue with that. So that's the issue with that, with those, with those sort of vaccines. Um, the other ones are the traditional viral vector ones, which I'm going to call AstraZeneca, uh, the recent Johnson & Johnson one, and it also includes the Sputnik, which is the Russian one. Uh, lastly, the traditional methods have mainly come from, I guess, the countries that um, have, I guess, lower technology or haven't put as much um, effort into, oh, sorry, not effort, it's the wrong word, but they don't have the technology to do the messenger RNA, so they're the Chinese and Indian ones. And lastly, the protein-based ones, also a new strain. Uh, Novavax has come out with it, but that was also the Australian one. But uh, unfortunately, that one got kiboshed because um, it cross-reacted with some HIV tests. So essentially, they're the, uh, they're the ones that exist. So if we go to the next slide. And the big thing um, with all these vaccines is the controversy about efficacy. Now, um, efficacy essentially is how good the vaccines are to prevent illness. And rather, they, it doesn't really mean you stop in getting the virus, but it means that you won't go into a hospital or you won't go into ICU. And it's all being measured in different ways. As, a, as that first quote says, everyone sort of measures it slightly differently. It's like saying, you know, how healthy are you? Well, how do you measure that? So um, the graph on the right shows um, also when you did it will also make a difference to your efficacy. So we, we know that um, Pfizer and uh, Moderna were the first to come out with no, in November with those, um, those strong numbers of 90% that really spurred the market on. But they actually did their testing in that green zone when the uh, infections rate were quite low. Johnson & Johnson, for instance, they didn't do their phase three testing until much later, in you know, October to uh, November, December, and so therefore their efficacy numbers aren't, don't look as good as the, the, the Pfizer Moderna ones. And so, as, as Radic, as we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but I thought you, you've expressed it quite well before to me in saying, you know, it's, it's this point about saying if only, um, you know, 10% of the population actually, or sorry, less than that, if, if 1 or 2% of the population have the disease and, and I've got a drug for it and I, and I go, out, go out walking around, I might not run into anyone who has it or I might only run into one or two people who have it so, that, so there's only a certain amount of times that the drug has a chance to, 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 to have an effect. But if there's 10 times as many people out in, in society who have that um, disease, then... Um, I've then got 10 times the chance to run into somebody who's got it and, and actually test out to see whether my uh, vaccine is actually working. And so that, and that, that flows into the efficacy numbers. Correct. Right? Yeah. So, that, so it's like um, 
if you've got a 5% chance, but you've got 10 times a 5% chance, you're going to have a, a much higher chance of getting it than if you've um, got a 5% chance and you only have three, three attempts. You know, you run into three people. So a lot of those um, early ones benefited, I guess, from that. And they also did not have to face the um, mutants, you know, the South African strain, the Engli uh, English, English strain and, and um, um, the ones in South America. So um, uh, efficacy is important, but I guess the important bit is the reduction infection of infections after a single dose. So for instance, AstraZeneca has now come out is, although it's claiming an 80% efficacy, it's, um, it's um, percentage chance of reducing you getting the disease is much lower at 67. And, and the Sinovac one, is it? Yeah. Uh, the Sinovac one is even lower. That came out with efficacy numbers of, of as low as 50.4, which was interesting because the uh, uh, WHO said it, it had to be above 50, but it also uh, reported 80% in Brazil. So um, because I guess it's a traditional vaccine, it's, um, it's, it's a lot cruder approach, I guess. It, it's not a targeted approach, so it's expected to have a lower... Um, efficacy but it can still be effective yeah and, um, but after one dose as well i think it had some very low numbers as well after one dose didn't well, it? oh yeah that's this is what i've looked into the what happened in chile and they've said after one dose it's been as low as three percent i don't know if that's um credible but um it, it's possible that after the first dose you, you usually sometimes make the boost of the second one sort of boosts the reaction of the first one mm -hmm. so it's, it's quite possible that um you need both to get that 50% efficacy and initially it probably doesn't give you much um, reaction at all. Mm. So uh, just the next slide on the vaccine side effects. So interesting, this is uh, very topical, I guess, with Johnson & Johnson's um, uh, being reviewed on, on the blood clotting. So if we look at those four categories that I spoke of, uh, the viral vectors, um, Oh, sorry, I've got that right. Yeah, the viral vectors, sorry, that's right. The viral vectors have been the ones that have been put on review. So that's the Johnson & Johnson and the AstraZeneca one. And I noticed just, just in the last 12 hours, uh, Russia's come out and actually says that, however, that it's Sputnik isn't um, seeing this blood clotting issue. But it's got something to do with the adjuvant. So what they do is they give you the, um, the, the vaccine. It also has an adjuvant in it. And the adjuvant um, uh, is thought to be associated with uh, the blood clotting. And interestingly, it's been found to be in young women you know, between the ages of eight, uh, 18 and 48. And um, it's not also well known that uh, women on the pill, that's also a, um, a blood clotting risk. So it could be some sort of reaction with that. So it needs more investigation. But and, and, the other, and the other factor as well was that um, I think it was that because so many health workers have been immunised um, and health workers tend to have you know, younger women working in nursing, um, you know, there's a question about whether you say, OK, well, maybe it's just that we've actually hit up a pop... That's, you're getting more people, more young women, because that's actually one of the, the populations that's been the first to, to be immunised in a lot of this. Uh, yeah. What is an adjuvant? Um, it sort of like stimulates the um, uh, immune system. So it's sort of like, um, it's like caffeine, I guess. It just sort of uh, hypes it up so that, so that the, if you put in a, um, uh, what you want to, to react against, the, the immune system is, is hyperactive to, to react to it. Because usually the immune system is quite dormant if there's no infections. So that's what the adjuvant essentially does. But interesting, uh, the messenger RNA, um, it has reactions against uh, people with allergies. And that's because it uses, um, in, in, in its creation, it uses polyethylene glycol. And um, trace elements of that can cause anaphylactic shock. And I was reading today actually that the, um, they were actually excluded from any of the studies so that they wouldn't actually uh, provide adverse reactions. But so therefore, you might not even know that you're um, allergic to polyethylene glycol, but if you take the 
messenger RNA one, it could induce um, anaphylactic shock. So each of them, um, so people with high allergies have been actually advised to take the, take the AstraZeneca one. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. But so the other one, the um, inactivated one, is probably uh, looks to be the least um, with lowest efficacy. However, it seems to have the uh, it seems to be the safest. And similarly with the protein-based vaccine. Although I do note that the Novavax, I think, has an adjuvant as well. So, you know, that, that might still be early days. The Novavax one has only really been out in the last couple of, two, three months. They've been doing the testing, so. Mm -hmm. All right, next slide. So here we are um, looking at the real-world evidence. So it's all well and good to talk about efficacy, but when you put it into the real world, um, uh, that's when it makes a difference because, for instance, some of the data on the Sputnik one uh, uh, was on males between the ages of 20 and 30, which seemed to be um, uh, sort of suspiciously a bit like the military ages in, in Russia, so, you know. <laughs> but when and, and, that, so, and that would have been some of the least likely to be infected by the, the virus anyway. Yeah, based yeah, on right. based on history, yeah. So, uh, most of the va uh, vaccinations have begun since early uh, December, and I think that chart shows where um, I think Israel's the classic book case, where it sort of had a, a huge surge, but reduced very quickly, which they have attributed to um, the vaccination, and they've got the highest vaccination, I guess, in the world. Similarly, you can see the US. And uh, the UK, similar trends, but Chile seems to be the um, outlier where they actually were one of the early adopters of vaccine, but they've used the Sinovac, the traditional sort of methodology. And that's what we were talking about before that I think there was a perfect storm where they, um, people got their first jab, they um, reduced restrictions, and, um, um, and they also got the Brazilian strain come across. So, sort of those three things worked against the vaccination. So, it seems to have turned at the moment, but, you know, the, the, the jury's out as to whether, um, you know, that will reduce with the vaccination. Lastly, I put Germany onto this graph just to show you what, um, this is a country with actually low vaccination, but, you know, quite a disciplined approach to, to shut down and um, um, social distancing. So, it's done reasonably well in contrast. Hmm. Okay. And the last, I think last one on vaccines, and then we might move into the investment. Last, last one is just to show you historically that vaccines are the magic bullet, but it can take time. They will bring it under control, but people who sort of believe it's going to be, you know, um, fixed in two, three months, it uh, doesn't seem to be. I mean, the best case there is diphtheria. You can see that sort of um, uh, fix itself within... Yeah, two, three years. Um, but I guess the important point is markets are really interested in um, when will they be, when will the vaccines enable normal economic activity. So we will, we will have um, COVID for the next three or four years, but if we don't have any lockdowns and any other effects, uh, is it really important for the economies? So and that's, I guess, leads on to the next topic, which I'll hand over to Damien. Any questions, I guess? <laughs> uh, look, we, oh, we had a question come in through... Um, I've had a question come in through the thing, but we might talk about that a little, yeah, bit, uh, yeah. little bit later. The, yep. More to do with markets and uh, the investment side. So. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, OK, so I think the there's a couple of things, and uh, I guess more now for Dave and I to sort of run through, is there's a, there's a few different angles to this. So the so first one is saying... Uh, I think when the vaccines hit um, and we had these sort of 90% efficacy rates in, in November and we've seen the, the US with a, you know, obviously a massive rollout um, throughout a, a, a very large number of people and, and very successful and, and similar in the UK is that I think the expectation from, from markets was, okay, this will, you know, they've sorted it out 
the US and UK are actually pretty bad at managing the virus. And so the fact that they've managed to, to roll the, the vaccines out means that everyone else should be able to do that. And so, um, you yeah, the world's back to normal. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, lockdowns will end. And, and um, yes, the virus will still be circulating. But if, if most people have been vaccinated and, and most of the people who have, um, that, that'll take the pressure off the hospitals and the people who have chosen not to be vaccinated, well, it's pretty hard for them to, to, to ask everyone else to lock down the economy because they've chosen not to not to have a vaccine. So I think that was, um, but, the, but the question now comes about saying, okay, well, if, if it's the case that um, we're gonna get a very uneven amount and um, and, and, the, and the vaccine rollout's actually gonna be quite slow, um, you know, which are the sectors where that's gonna, that's gonna affect the most? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the travel sector is you know, the most obvious one, which jumps out in terms of saying there's uh, you know, a, a slower recovery to that. It, from, from the numbers we're looking at, um, there still looks to be a, uh, a reasonable case for the, for the, the, the stocks we're invested in. Um, they're still not particularly expensive. And uh, we've also chosen very much some of the lower risk ones in that, um, you know, we've picked airlines that have large domestic markets, for example. Mm. Um, and rather than airlines that, that are flying in between countries where you do have the risk of, lo or a much bigger risk of lockdowns. Obviously, Australia's, you know, got its own state by state lockdown. But, yep. you know, I guess, I guess you know, for, for, for example, um, you know, we've picked sort of some regional uh, airlines in the US who, um, who are much less likely to have state-by-state -state lockdowns and much more likely to be, be open on, on, a, on a similar basis. So I sort of feel as if the travel stuff, yes, it's been put back, but I don't think it's a, I don't think um, given that the valuations we're already looking at and, 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 and that they have reduced their costs quite dramatically, um, you know, I still think there's, there's some scope within that, mm -hmm. but, but I'd be more circumspect about um, just buying any travel company, I guess. I'll mm -hmm. just add that, um, I mean, the evidence in the US, at least where the, the vaccine rollout is going so swimmingly mm. is that uh, the first thing people do is jump on a plane. Yes. Uh, and so although international borders are obviously going to be slower than internal, mm. uh, you know, if you do reach that tipping point where it goes from government responsibility to individual responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the virus, mm. uh, then Know, the the pent up demand for travel is is very high. That's, yes, that's what the US, as a leading indicator, is suggesting. Yeah, and the amount of savings, household savings, that have yep. been not not right across every, you know, it's not evenly distributed. Like the the, the poorer uh, people have have basically run down their savings, but um, they they weren't generally the people jumping on planes anyway. Mm. Um, and so it was more likely to be that the, the middle class who have built up their savings quite quite considerably. Yep. And so yeah, it's a question about saying when when it turns back on. Uh, there's another um, this factor between manufacturing and services is the other one. So um, yeah, our take has been that the uh, and, and what you've seen very much is that there's been a real focus on on manufacturing. So people have been buying a lot of goods. So. Uh, you know, I can't go out and have uh, the same number of haircuts. I can't go out and travel as much as I want to travel. I can't go out and have massages and, and go to the movies and, and use all these types of services that, that you would have otherwise did. And the bank account's sort of building up because of that. And I think then people have come back and gone, well, I will buy more stuff. I'll buy a new couch or I'll buy a new TV. And I'll, you know, the, there's been a lot more homewares uh, bought over this time period. And so that's, that's been a, obviously a big positive for manufacturing. Uh, there's a question about, so, so the, the idea between the switch between manufacturing and services um, probably gets put back a little bit in Europe mm -hmm. in particular um, and, and countries where you, you have got um, sort of, I think Australia is probably not the case given we've got a, you know, we're, we're pretty open already, um, but, but countries that, are, that have got this slow background of, of rollouts, um, you know, I think there's that, that manufacturing versus services is, a, is, a, um, is going to be affected. So uh, just a little bit more time, I suppose. Um, we've got a sort of a mix of the two and we're sort of gradually moving towards more services. Mm. Um, it probably slows a little bit, the, the move across, just to make sure that you know, everything's ticking along, but, but we still think there's, you know, depending, depending upon value, um, you know, there are some, some, some opportunities still to, to keep going with that manufacturing to services switch. Yep. Okay. Um, just actually, just while we're on this slow vaccine roll, that piece, um, so Radic had a great set of, a uh, great chart up earlier, just sort of covering off from diphtheria and a couple of other ones and obviously showing that, you know, there's, you know, inter-decade 
uh, effects on vaccines. Um, obviously, this one's there's a much more concerted effort um, in doing that. So, you know, is, is a decade to, to see the end of COVID effects, um, you know, something you'd, you'd think about, seeing as the other one sort of took two to three decades, you know, with the, Ab- you know, the effort absolutely that's been put in. For, especially because uh, developing markets and emerging markets um, are going to be a lot slower. Yep. Um, and I think there's going to be, uh, yeah, I think what we'll find is that the the fact that uh, developed markets like uh, Australia, you know, France, Germany, some some quite sophisticated advanced economies can't get their their um, roll out right. Their rollout right yep. means um, you know to turn around and expect Indonesia or or Papua New Guinea to to, to be all over this is yep. is, is you know, too much to ask. Mm. Well, uh, Indonesia's moving a lot quicker than Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't yes. everybody's moving a lot quicker than Australia? Oh, yes. <laughs> so. well, this, this we, we won't dwell too much on on how badly we're doing because we could we could spend a whole podcast with that. We could, yeah, yeah. Um, very good. So the other thing that was worth noticing on this slow vaccine rollout is. Um, you know, there was this whole idea that there was some vaccine winners and vaccine losers, mm. and technology stocks in particular seem to really benefit from um, you know, just this acceleration of the trend. Yep. And it's important to note that um, you know, people are creatures of habit. They stop doing things, and the longer they spend doing something new, whether it's you know, Zoom meetings or not working in the office or, or whatever it is, yep. then the more those get entrenched. And so I think... And the harder um, it is to go back to the ways of the ex- old. Exactly. Yep. And so I do think there's a... There's a, there's a um, the, long, the, the, the other impact of the slow roll- vaccine rollout is that the vaccine winners will, will continue to be winners for longer mm. and, and potentially it will entrench them more. So uh, the office is a great example. Um, if you had been out of the office for three months and then you got back into the office and, and you're, you're back and running, then there's much much less of a chance you'll, you'll go back to work from home on a, on a, on a longer term basis. Mm-hmm. However, if you've just spent a year working from home um, and you're about to spend another six months or another year potentially working from home, then, you know, by the end of that second year, the chance of you jumping straight back into the office full time is, is much lower than, yep. than if, if the shutdown had have only been a year and then much lower if it only had been only three months. So, um, you know, it's not, obviously that's not the case for every stock, but but generally speaking, you know, our, our take is that the virus winners, uh, are, the winners are going to get stronger and the losers are going to get weaker as a, as a general sort of rule. Okay. Yeah, from this, just from the, the habits that are, that are being generated. Mm-hmm. Not sure, Dave, if you had any other, any other thoughts on the no, Sinovac vaccine? No, that's rollout. good. Yeah. So the next part then is, um, is Sinovac. Um, so, yeah, so Chile's a good, Chile's a good example. So mm. saying, okay, that's, that's, our, that's our canary in the coal mine. Um, about they've had a large proportion of the population vaccinated. Uh, they have had a lot of problems. Uh, Chile is also the world's largest uh, exporter of copper, mm-hmm. so you know, important in terms of um, in terms of commodities from from that perspective. Yep. Uh, they have had problems with uh, production over the last year or so because of uh, coronavirus shutdowns. Now, there's a whole bunch of different moving parts in this. One is that um, people are getting used to managing. The virus. It's, it's, it was one, you know, the the, the effect on on production um, in March last year and, and April last year was significantly higher than the effect um, this year. Because mm. just because we're used to shutdowns, we now have policies, we now have procedures. Um, people have masks. We're not sort of wondering, you know, where do we actually get these masks from? And can, asking people to make the cloth ones from home and stuff mm. like that. <laughs> there are actually you know procedures in place. So so supply chains haven't been as affected as as much as before in those commodity area but um you know if you if you've got lockdowns and then, then chances are it's going to affect them so that's, that's sort of one side of it the other side is uh the chinese stimulus so china was the first you know first in and first out and have done a great job in terms of locking it down but but they need a they need a uh, uh a vaccine that works so mm-hmm. that they don't have to keep locking down their own economy and if, but if they do have to keep locking down or if they can't travel, then it probably means more stimulus. And so Davis, our, our expert on Chinese stimulus, I don't know if you want to riff for a little bit. Yeah, you. well, uh, I mean, that's certainly uh, the case, but I, I'd still couch that as a risk case at this stage rather than the base case. Mm. Um, they, they've become quite adept at stomping on the virus, vaccinated or not. Mm. And because they're so large to shut down one city, I mean, if we shut down... Victoria here, you know, it, it erases whatever 20%. it is of GDP. But yeah. you shut down a city in China, nobody notices mm. uh, in terms of growth or output. So 
they've become very good at managing the virus without a vaccine and yeah it looks like Sinovac's pretty lousy uh, so they're going to take take some time in well, terms of vaccinating the population. Uh, not, not that I want to cast aspersions on their, their science community but they're, they, they do have in their, te- in their business community a, a history of learning from others let's put it that way um <laughs> and so there may be you know except, except may, perhaps in the production of coronaviruses yeah but anyway right. we won't but go they, there but they might uh they might well uh learn from the others and and come up with some messenger rna yeah, technologies right. themselves and yeah and look there are waves of second and third generation vaccines coming i think there are over 30 the last time i looked and that was some weeks ago uh, and so no doubt they'll they'll get it straight Eventually, uh, I think their management regime of the virus is sufficiently strong to not be concerned that they'll need to stimulate again. Yes, um, but but the risk case is. But there is a risk if, case. If we see that Chile, for example, you know the outbreaks don't stop, and and it's yeah. clear that Sinovac is way less efficient than. Um, it's a possibility. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So. Um, yes. But for the time being, they are quite uh, determined to tighten. They're actually removing stimulus. Mm. Um, at a reasonable clip, not it's not dramatic, but it's it's mm. definitely material tightening. So, uh, and you know, even if they have an outbreak or two, uh, you know, they've got some very strong sectors uh, that will continue to grow. External sector is absolutely booming, mm. as we know, they're pouring. And a lot of that's that manufacturing we're talking about. Is, yeah, when yes. people want to buy a new couch rather than going and that's right. Go and and all that industrial that's production has just absolutely sailed through second and third waves everywhere else. Mm. Um, so that is more or less immune anyway yep. without vaccines. Uh, and then, you know, that <coughs> excuse me, you know, triggered to some extent by the Cold War and just the needs of their development model running out of you know, kind of a runway for adding debt to these unproductive segments. Uh, they're they're tipping a lot of money investment into higher value add manufacturing tech, etc. Mm. And productivity adding um, stuff. So and 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 tech tends to need less cement than uh, it does. So those things are going are going really strongly, mm. and for the time being, they appear quite determined to. Well, they have started again down the path we saw when first, when Xi Jinping first came to power of, of economic restructuring, mm. which they do need, desperately need to do. Uh, and at the moment, the vaccine or uh, difficulties with Sinovac are not on the radar for yeah. for disrupting that. But you you just never know. Yeah, and so yeah, uh, that's that's a very good way to clarify it because I think as I said, it's it's a risk case, and the risk case is that Sinovac doesn't work. Uh, you've got some emerging markets like like Chile having production problems with commodities, and at the same time, China's has to throw a whole bunch more money at building bridges sure. and and buildings and all that type of stuff, and commodities comes back on again. Mm-hmm. But as I said, we don't think that's the base case, but that's the one you need to watch watch for in terms yeah. of Sinovac problems. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the other one's the soft diplomacy part is um, you know, China did sort of roll this out as a bit of a you know hey guys we're you know although the virus didn't come from china we, we really <laughs> want to help you guys you know <laughs> and so uh you know i think it's been their, their diplomatic sort of angle um and so it's obviously one thing to say to people hey you know here's a whole bunch of viruses really cheap a whole bunch of vaccines really cheap they're going to help but if those vaccines don't actually work then um you've possibly done yourself more damage than if you had never provided the the vaccines in the first place. Look, that's right, and they, they've tended to hose the Sinovac all over emerging markets mm. Mm. Uh, where most of their allies dwell, and that actually has a, 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 a... It's a small piece of a very much larger picture here, which is uh, because um, China is tightening and has come out of this first and is re- re-entering restructuring and it's going to slow reasonably quickly um, it's not going to lead this new cycle and conversely we have this new regime in the US you know a, a democratic uh, president and a need to uh, deliver wage growth that supports the Democrats mm. uh, over populists like Donald Trump uh, and then this uh, sort of shift towards MMT thinking in economics has has basically driven a huge surge in fiscal spending in the US and so, so let's, let's actually jump to that because that's I think the next slides we're, yeah, we're talking more about the, these une- the uneven 
um, the investment effect of uneven economic growth. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so the uh, in effect, you know, China and its many emerging market kind of partners are very commodity based, and so if China is going to slow, emerging markets are going to have difficulty with uh, with their external sectors. Um, and then they're going to have difficulty domestically because they're having trouble rolling out vaccines, um, in particular, obviously, from Sinovac and China. Mm. And so there's a bit of a multiplication um, problem on that. And then when you add the, the booming US, which is doing so well with the vaccine, plus the stimulus it's got, uh, then you, you know, we think, get into a scenario where you could get a, uh, a you know, basically... The U.S. is going to be the engine of, of the global recovery for the next few years. China's going to slip back to the caboose, and the emerging markets are going to slip even further behind that. And and that gives you a scenario where you might get a rising U.S. dollar, which then exacerbates all of those factors. Mm. Uh, and so I, I, it's not an implausible scenario that the difficulty with Sinovac tips into what be, could become quite problematic for emerging markets in the next, you know, a year or so away mm. uh, if we get this tearaway US recovery, slowing China, difficulties with vaccines in those emerging markets. Then you get the compounded effect of the US dollar blowing up emerging market interest rates uh, and the US dollar funding problems externally plus commodities are coming off into China, plus their domestic demand struggling because of the vaccine. Mm. And you could, you could actually, if you run that through, if it plays out, you, get, you actually end up in an emerging market crisis scenario, yeah. more or less. Yeah. Um, and, and the other one I was talking about before is saying we've got, so we know the world's sort of full is debt. Um, and you, you look at corporate debt and the central banks are going, okay, if the corporate debt spreads blow out, we'll jump in and buy them. You know, this, we're, we're going to back the corporate be- debt market. You look at the household debts, which are high, and governments are basically saying, well, if you can't pay your mortgage, don't do it. You know, we'll, we'll let you, you don't have to, we won't kick you out. Or, and, and all these extra programs to help people so that people don't go bankrupt. Um, Governments have turned their printing presses on. Yeah, they generally don't need it. So um, I guess what I'm saying, you're looking at all the... Where, where can things go wrong? You know, maybe there's some hedge funds blow up and that could, that could cause some problems, but chances are if they do blow up and it's systematic, um, again, central banks will step in. So you sort of go, well, there's, there's sort of this safety net. If, though, you know, the Turkish market blows up, you're not going to see a no. lot of widespread public demand in yeah. Europe to say, you know, spend some money to, to bail out Turkey or spend some... You know. and, and, in fact, you know, some of those safety nets that you're describing are actually part of the problem for emerging markets yes. eventually. Because, yeah. you know, the US, for instance, where you, you have, you know, uh, runaway support for monetary and fiscal, which mm. is going to produce some inflation over the next, you know, 12, 18 months as their uh, labour market tightens. Mm then, you know, that, that is going to add even further pressure, upwards pressure on the US dollar and more external pressure on the emerging markets. And so uh, although we've had a reasonably shared experience to date in terms of the support that's come from governments mm. and the benefit to the global economy, it's not going to stay that way, I don't think. Yeah. You know, and we're starting to see differentiation and fragmentation. Mm. And already. then your other problem comes from, um, you know, if, if this means you've got some developing markets in lockdowns and supply chain issues because things are being shut down and, and turned on and all that type of stuff, um, we've already had this, this uh a real push to, to re-onshore a lot of production you know, globally because people are just saying, well, you know, I don't want to have the next virus breaks out and, and we can't get our masks because they're all produced in China and China's locked down. Yeah. You know, people want to have start re- re-onshoring things. And so that then just actually adds to that emerging market as well because it's, uh, you know, they're having some problems and, and lockdowns and, and virus out of control. And yep. at the same time, you know, companies in the US and, and Europe and Australia are, are actually saying, well, I'm actually closing that factory down. I'm just going to do it. You know, I'm going to build some robots and do it locally so that I've got the, my supply locally. Well, I, I guess during the crisis itself, you know, there hasn't been a lot of that. that you know, we had this period of deglobalisation via Trump mm. leading into the crisis. And during the crisis, it's just been a bit of a mad scab grab. And, you know, so some of those, some of those forces were lifted for a little while Mm. Um, but uh, I think as we come back to a more rational 
more rational settings and things to start to settle absolutely yeah and, and we'll see that and yeah. you've, you've already had the uh you know biden's got his his people looking at the supply chain issues in the u.s and, oh, and yes. what's and you know what what's been outsourced that should yeah. to offshore mm. that shouldn't and have I, been I think outsourced a, a huge part of his um, mm. forthcoming two trillion dollar infrastructure stimulus mm. uh is directed at that yeah yep um, actually technology leadership re- on uh, onshoring um building out the local supply chain Mm -hmm. it's all integral Mm. So it just actually leads into an interesting uh, question or more of a statement perhaps from Nick and uh, you've got some, some great questions coming. I've got one for you, Radic, in a minute as well, just so you know. Um, uh, the, uh, so thanks, Nick, for, for this one. Does China really need to stimulate uh, that much when they already benefit from Western countries' stimuluses? Stimuli? Uh, most stimulus money in the West is spent on stuff made in China. <laughs> yeah, no, that's exactly our point yeah. when, we, when we talk about... Uh, China having a boom, booming external sector. Yep. That's a wanky way of saying exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, like and, we're, we are importing a hell of a lot of Chinese stuff. Everybody yep. is, and, mm. um, owing yeah. to all of that, yeah. that you and, know, frenzied Western stimulus. And, and yeah. Australia is giving big tax cuts to people who spend money on KFX to, to buy stuff made in China. To yeah. buy your factory gear from yeah. China. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but but part of that comes as well is I, I guess um, the, the the main issue for commodities that we we're talking about on that is uh, you know if China initially had to get out. And and stimulate just to, to go build more apartments and bridges and you know roads to nowhere. Yep. Um, in terms of doing that, that's very commodity intensive, and particularly buildings is, is uses a lot of iron ore, uses a lot of copper, um, uses a lot of cement. Um, so as they then start going, okay, I don't need to, you know, I, I can. I'll, I'll put some people in there because their factory wasn't going, and now the factory's going ballistic. I can let pe- I can shift people off the construction sector and back into to factories. Mm. You need a lot less uh, commodities in terms mm-hmm. of that, like the amount of um, steel and the amount of co- copper that gets used in um, uh, buildings in particular is is just astronomically higher than um, you know having to produce whatever goods they are producing, couches and and cars and all that type of stuff yep. is just it's just not in the same ballpark. Yeah, yeah sure. To, just to be clear. Um, for the time being, uh, China is booming. The global economy is booming. There's catch-up growth everywhere. It's yep. absolutely, you know, pedal to the metal everywhere. We're not saying this is going to fall fall off a cliff, mm-hmm. uh, but these are the the forces that are coming to bear. There's kind of ruffles in the headwaters, you know, that are going to flow downstream over the next. I think China will become apparently become more slow. Uh, will be slowing through the second half of this year, but mm-hmm. uh, 2022 is really what we're talking about yep. here. So. Okay. Um, and uh, as promised, Radic, uh, we've got one yeah. here from Nick. A um, couple of them, actually, but I'll, I'll go to the, the main one. Uh, do you guys have any data on how effective these vaccines are on the Brazilian and South African strains? Um, you can take that on notice. Total data it shows that the vaccines aren't as um, effective against them. In fact, I think the AstraZeneca one was one of the better ones mm. against those viruses. Yeah. But, um, well, and the Johnson Johnson has basically been tested on those viruses largely, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so it's actually yes, it's similar um, style though, isn't it? Similar style of vi- of vaccine. Yeah. Yep. I think the overarching thing I would say um, to, in terms of mutations, not to say you couldn't have a mutation that all of a sudden causes issues, but the fact that we developed so many vir- so many vaccines in such a short period of time, like mm. the vaccines, you know, were a month, two months in, like a lot of these before they started the testing, and then they had six months worth of testing, and then they got rolled out. The fact we could develop so many vaccines and so many different types of vaccines in such a shorter period of time, I think, bodes pretty well for saying if there is a, a, a variant that gets away from it and doesn't get caused that, that there'll be another, there'll be a variation on the vaccine yeah, update. that can that can yeah. solve that problem. Especially the messenger RNA ones, they're very quick. And if they've been proved to be, I mean, this is the first messenger RNA vaccine that has been released. Mm. So um, we really are at the, at the pointy end of the spear with, with these vaccines because we, we don't know the long-term effects of messenger RNA vaccines. But, you know, it's the same when other people took vaccines in the 20s. They didn't know either. So, but the advantage of them are is that you can quickly um, alter alter it and, and, and churn them out, as, we, as we've seen. Mm. The other point which I didn't um, point out is that... Um, 
Of the four big vaccine makers, three of them actually failed in making vaccines. Sanofi, Merck and Glaxo are huge in the vaccine industry and all their vaccines failed. So it's, it really has been like a, a, a group effort where some, you know, you don't hear about that sort of aspect of it. You'd think that they would have been in the forefront, but their, their vaccines actually got um, uh, discontinued. So, you know, while the Chinese one perhaps isn't as effective, you know, at least they, they got the, you know, three, three big companies didn't even manage to, to make the 50%. Mm. So Good good point. Good point. Right. Next. Uh, so, next thing is is how does this affect um, you know, the, your, your different sectors of the market? So, I think there's a. Uh, it's the issue about saying, look, if, if vaccine rollouts continue to be uneven and um, uh, and you've got different, you've got a lower growth rate effectively in many areas. It probably means bond yields lower. Um, than, than they would have otherwise been in in certainly in those markets, whether there's yet more of a difference to the U.S. I suppose mm. maybe and maybe that means the U.S. doesn't need to rise as high because it's you know it might be trading at a at a one percent premium to the European bonds where there's problems getting the rolling out, but you know that that's enough of a differential to to attract the capital it needs. Yep. Whereas yeah, if Europe is going well as well, I mean we're not particularly hawkish on inflation. Like, no. Um, we still see very, very powerful deflationary forces, but there's, there's no doubt that where there is going to be inflation is the U.S. Hmm. I mean, it's going, to, it's going in, to, in a relative sense. In a relative bad. sense, yeah. it's going to lead inflation, and, and it, and you know, there'll, there'll be a wider and wider gap to other countries, especially as China slows, hmm. uh, and that's really the problem that we're kind of getting to over the, as the recovery matures a little over the next year or two. Yes, um, is that the US is just um, so uh, got so many tailwinds versus others that uh, so that you know the central bank support is more likely to come off there earlier than elsewhere, mm. uh, and, and arguably already has. Yes, it has, um, and like they'll be tapering mm. before anyone else does before we get to rate rises. Mm. They don't really have uh, the subtlety of macro prudential to work with either. Whereas, as we, we've already seen in New Zealand, and we will see here next year, I think, we can tighten on mortgages. Individually. Uh, with a, without, in, yeah. without raising uh, cash rate. And, <laughs> and therefore, bond yields you know, can be more contained here. Yep. Uh, and quite frankly, I think uh, at the rate that house prices are going up and confidence with them, like uh, a, a moderate macro prudential tightening could have a huge impact. And yeah, and I, so I just think that mitigates against the RBA having to move very, very quickly. But, I mean, that's the case more or less everywhere. The US is just going to rip out of this and uh, everyone else is eating dust. Mm. Just so a couple of quick ones. So one, why, why doesn't the US use macro prudential? Can they not? Is it impossible? Uh, or is it just something that they don't need uh, to? Like they've discussed it at various times. Like um, Janet Yellen used to talk about it. Mm-hmm about expanding the toolkit and stuff, but it just never got any traction. Um, I mean, it, maybe, maybe as well, though, the problem was at the time was trying to get growth, I suppose. And yeah. Now, it's, it's sort of now that they... Like Look, they discussed it kind of in that post-GFC yeah. period where asset price booms and busts were obviously still at the forefront mm. of people's thinking, but that's certainly fallen away. And yes, as you say... I went through this low inflation, low low growth mm. period, and or secular stagnation, and it mm. really the discussion really turned on how to how to get more. Better growth. release but, the handbrake, yeah, not pull it yeah, up. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, they, they, there's no real discussion of it. Yep. Okay. In the US, mm. and a question that's come in from Nick. He's been active today. Thanks for all your comments. And anyone else who's looking at commenting or questioning, please pop them in. Um, do you have a target on when the U- on where the ten year US Treasury will be over the next twelve months? Yeah. Well, if I, higher I mean, or I lower? Can, I can lower ha- or higher? I can have a target, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think it'll. I think it'll. I think it will be higher at some point over mm-hmm. the next 12 months, yes. Okay. Um, uh, when that will be is obviously the critical question. I still, uh, you know, we just had what was a reasonably strong inflation print in the US mm. 
uh, just two days ago and it and it just crashed yields <laughs> yep right because uh, i think principally because the market had moved a little bit ahead of it but principally because the the fed's uh, key inflation metric that it uses is is the laggard of all of them um, it uses core pce and uh, I think headline was 2.6 and 5 and 0.5 on the month, which is pretty hot. Uh, but core PC is 1.4, and I think up 0.1 or two mm. on the month. So, um, so we've got another couple, maybe uh, two or three months of really red hot inflation numbers to come in. Uh, you know, I find it, I find it difficult to believe that yields won't pop on those to some extent, but it could be as it was, just was, sell the fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, then after that, um, we will see, you know, because a lot of this is base effect inflation, um, we'll start to see that come off. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so, you know, you, the core PCE, I expect, will be under 2% probably all year. Um, but then you start to get into this scenario next year where, uh, you know, they're still going through catch-up growth, They've got this immense fiscal tailwind and their labour market will really be tightening, you know, well below 5% unemployment, probably 4%, uh, and going like the clappers. And so I expect you would see yields rising there again. Mm-hmm. And that would be, I would certainly foresee that happening within the next 12 months. So I suppose the answer is I see the possibility of a short-term spike and then uh, some... Right off. So yeah, and then, then some some a period of easy, easier yields, and but pretty quickly moving to high yields again, when people start to discount, you know, what the recovery in the U.S. Um, as the labour market especially tightens. Mm. Yeah. Okay. But that said, um, we still don't see a huge inflationary blow off or anything. Yep. So, I, I, my my target for the two year, I, like the ten year, you know, we we could maybe poke our head above two percent you know maybe even two and a half at some point over the next 18 months just answer the next question thanks for that how well high uh no do you see it, do you see it hit two <laughs> percent yeah i do it. i think so yeah okay very good yeah and but, and uh, but i don't see it, so i don't see it blowing up right yeah. but backing yeah. up crazy and yeah yeah and uh, at two percent you know the um you know we do need to take a, a big step back and that's just right say, you know two percent we're expecting inflation around two percent or, or possibly higher it's it's zero Low. real yields, yeah. possibly even negative real yields yeah. at two percent. So yeah, that's right. It's not um, on, on a ten-year basis. Yes. It's, it's not. We're not talking about. Oh, yeah. Maybe we'll have two or three years of you know a negative one. It's like ten years ten of this. Years. Yeah. This. So yeah. I mean, it's interesting if you go out a little more long term. Mm. Um, uh, you know, if the US continues to. To, because the Biden infrastructure package is, you know, going to end up adding, say, three hundred, four hundred billion dollars worth of growth every year for the next six or eight years, the US will grow at three percent, like clockwork mm-hmm. or, or above, uh, and the labour market should keep tightening. And so, you know, you go out a few years, it's possible that we'll, we'll actually will see um, some higher yields. Yep. Um, but mitigating against that again is this story about China, where it's going to utilise all of this. US growth engine to restructure itself and that is going to hammer commodities mm. and I know that this is a very unfashionable view where everybody thinks buy commodities because of US inflation but you know if you actually look at what what the US stimulus does to commodity volumes it's bugger all China's the, the big, big consumer yep. and if it, it's going to slow materially it's going to completely outdo anything the US can do in terms of the balance of, of commodity consumption. Mm-hmm. So, you, so, you so we, we spoke, you know, Copper's mm. the, the real sort of front yeah. end of that one, and CRU came out and said, um, which is a big you know, forecasting group, and they basically, their, their estimate is that a, a trillion dollars of stimulus equals about another 110,000 uh, tonnes of copper mm-hmm. that's needed. And now the copper market is, is 30 million uh, so it's 110,000 on 30 million. On 30 like million. It's just a, it's a, rounding a, tr- error. a trillion dollars of stimulus is a rounding <laughs> yeah. error, exactly. And, yeah. and, um, well, a, lot, a lot of the US stimulus is just not construction. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. You know, a lot yeah. of it's human development, tech, as we were saying, onshoring. Also, also, it's a very good package. I think it's yeah. fantastic. And, and uh, the most but it's, of, it's not like a Chinese package. No. Like, it's not hard assets. And, and, no. and your, real, your real need for steel is actually uh, is buildings, is, is high-rise buildings. Mm, yeah. So when, when you go through, even when you look at um, you know, using 
doing bridges and roads and, and, and railways, which you sort of would think would use, you know, all this extra steel. Yes, they use steel, but compared to um, yeah, throwing up a, f a couple of um, skyscrapers, it just pales in significance, like yep. the, the amount that they actually spent on infrastructure. So, you know, your real thing is if you're not throwing up skyscrapers, then you don't need anywhere near as much steel. And the, 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 um, the general trend from every developed market in the world, and I'm, and I'm assuming you'll get this in emerging markets as well, is they don't want to live in apartments anymore. Mm. They, there's a huge, much bigger demand for, um, for, for houses. Yeah, low density. For low density. Yep. And um, you don't need as many office buildings because um, people are... <laughs> the low density house is your can. office. <laughs> yeah, and, and then uh, yeah, retail yeah. Is, is, is struggling so, as well. Yeah. So, so sell steel and buy lumber. Yeah. Lumber, get into lumber trade. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's, it's the point about saying if, you, if you're not building high-rises, you don't need steel. You don't yeah. need anywhere near as much steel. steel. And so yeah. a very All small copper. change in that. All right, very good. Well, we better press on. Uh, so, we'll oh, sorry, the last one was the domestic versus international focus. Ah, uh, well. sure. Yep. So, as as we're going through looking for stocks and trying to work out what to buy, it is an, um, you know, we we buy international stocks. Um, the the thing is where the comp where the stocks are listed um, isn't always where they generate all their revenue from. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in the last uh, sort of last month, you know, some of the stocks that did the best for us was uh, some of the uh, cement stocks we'd bought a little while ago, looking for exposure to, to US infrastructure and, and, and growth in terms of that area. Um, but we bought the ones that are listed in Europe. So two, Lafarge, Wholesome and... Um, Andrew Blank on the other one, <laughs> uh, but they're, so, and, and so they're in downtrodden markets. We don't want to get them at reasonable you value. Can, you can buy them much cheaper over there, but yep. you're still picking up. You're still getting all the gains all in the terms demand. of the demand gains because they are global stocks. Lots of exposure to to the US and, and pick up those types of. Um, and so yeah, so it's sort of it's clever trying to look for. You know, for us, it's, it's 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 about digging into the actual stocks. It's not a matter of just saying, oh, okay, I shouldn't buy anything in Europe because um, anything in Europe is going to be slower than yeah. and you know, vaccines aren't as quick. Just about saying, well, which are the companies in Europe which are exposed to the US or exposed to, to the UK or, or other areas in the world which are, um, you know, which are actually growing quickly? Yep. And so they're going to be the, the stars of, of the local stock markets, but you can usually buy them at, at much cheaper rates than if you, you had to go to the US and buy a similar stock. So, so the stocks we were buying um, were, you know, ballpark 30, 40% cheaper than, wow. than the equivalent stocks you'd, you'd buy in the US. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. just a, a matter of trying to trying to find the, the best exposure to that. So, yeah, that's the other, the real focus on on that investment effect. All right, wonderful. Uh, finally, risks. I think we're up to finally, aren't we? Yep, finally, risks. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think I just wanted to highlight, I mean, this I've, I've left this slide up there. It's the one we've put up every week. But I just wanted to highlight that very first one. So we've spoken about all the other stuff within this. But that very first one needs to come back every single time, is that... Um, Markets are driven by central banks and by government policies at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's not we're not in a normal market, mm -hmm. and so our number one risk always has to be policy error. And we need to keep keep coming back. And it's a reminder for us as well to to keep talking to people and saying policy error is your biggest issue. Is that central banks pulling out too early? Governments, you know, r removing stimulus too early. Um, they're they're the biggest risks the market faces mm -hmm. um, when we're sort of in this. Yeah, government government, government stimulus, artificial, yeah, that's right. artificially stimulated market. They which can give which it and they can take it away. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, um, so we've been through the virus and vaccines. We've covered off an emerging markets crisis. Yeah, I think we've covered those we've pretty well. Rolled into the debt crisis. I think we're at the end. Uh, well, I mean, that's, final notes. Yeah, I mean, debt crisis is is just as we discussed. You could you could get some contagion and blowback coming out of emerging markets if these various forces come to bear on them over the next 18 months or so. Uh, but for the time being, everything's just gangbusters. Like, this is the this is uh, future trends. Yep. A yeah. uh, couple of questions, if you would mind. Yep, all right. So uh, we've got one here from Greg. Uh, if the ALP win next year's election, um, presumably at a federal level, do you see the ALP having an infrastructure stimulus package and what would they target? Uh, it's been interesting, isn't it? National infrastructure I, stimulus. Maybe uh, NBN 2.0. Uh, I mean <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, NBN 2.0. Yeah. Just uh, NBN 1.0. 1.0, yeah. Same, right. The same yeah. We've already got NBN 2.0. Um, <laughs> we'll just go back to the original design. Like I haven't actually looked into, into what their platform says, but they're usually banging on about 
infrastructure. Do we still uh, have a federal Labor Party? Uh, we do. Okay. Yeah. Um, but well, they, they're, they're actually favourites to win. But so. do they do they have a, do they have a platform? Is the question, or are they just? They, I think they're. Playing well, the they're, I mean, they're, the they're playing small target, obviously, yeah. and yeah. and you know either through good fortune or genius that's working superbly because you know the government's intent on making it such a big <laughs> fat target. Um, so uh, would they would they go after infrastructure? Well, I mean it, it, it's. I mean that's just a very multifaceted question. I think um, I think the main issue for that is so the answer the answer is maybe the thing is we're a year away from getting to that point, mm. and even if they got in and, and launched as soon as they possibly could once they're in, well, given you know you're another six or twelve months away from from actually you know, shovels in the ground. Yep. So um, it's it's an interesting one to keep an eye on, but I think there's no real investment. Um, yeah, I mean, the key consideration is where, where will the economy be? Exactly. There's a lot of water yeah. to go under the bridge still, isn't there? There is. Yep. Uh, I know at the moment we're absolutely cracking along, but uh, we should we will slow as the whole catch-up growth phenomenon passes. Mm. Yep. Um, and then, then uh, probably the key question is what, actually what will the Labor Party do about uh, the, our monetary policy regime and house prices? Mm. Uh, and, you know... After no, what? Nothing. After what New Zealand's done? Well, yeah. I, I actually don't. I'm not so sure because, you know, it's pretty popular in certain segments. Well, Most they, of those segments are in the, uh, in the labour base. They won't announce anything. No, no, they, they won't announce anything. Well, but they have already committed to doing an RBA review. Right. Yeah. Right. Now, one one possible outcome of that is to simply replicate what Jacinda Ardern has done and force both APRA and the RBA to take explicitly take house prices into consideration mm-hmm. um, so if we ended up there then definitely i can see fiscal stimulus yep in the form of infrastructure yep in okay. fact i if that was a, a a policy mix that they proposed i'd cheer it on that'd be great mm-hmm. you know um, it's a bit, bit uh, of an election killer though isn't it but oh you, you won't see any of that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> beforehand yeah no. sure i think i think their main policy is we're not them is yeah yep. yeah and they I, I, yeah, my expectation is you won't see hardly any announcements about what, what they're going to do. This is what we're not going to do. Yep. We're not going to do them. We're not going to mm. be there. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, there'll be lots of stuff about, you know, um, how we're going to lift women, for instance. You yeah. Know. Uh, but it'll, it'll all be uh, positive stuff, mm. you know. There's one bit of federal infrastructure you can always rely on in election time is the fast rail between Melbourne and Sydney, which runs once every four oh, yeah. years. Yeah, 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 and elections, true. election time, whether or not it actually gets up. But um, Yeah, well, that's the other question everyone's going to face next year is international borders and mass immigration. Um, uh, at the rate our labour market is tightening, we probably are going to see some wage rises, you know, 12 months out, probably, a 2022 story, maybe later in 2022, if they don't get the international borders open and flood us with temporary workers. Um, uh, you know, what, what What will they do about that as mm. well? Like, you know, there's just a lot of inputs here that are too vague at the moment to, to be able to forecast accurately what they would do with specifics. Yep. Yeah. So and it is worth noting, just, just as a reminder, of, um, you know, we, we did our Aussie dollar post uh, podcast last week, mm. and we're still on that same theme: is that you know you need to be using Aussie dollar strength now as a chance to start putting your money into international assets and, and really shifting shifting offshore. Yep, and that's still you know still play on with that theme for Australia. So there's yes, we're interested in what's happening in Australia, and you know from an investment perspective, we need to be lining it up. Too early to make investments on basis of elections or anything like that. Yep, but um, yeah, so I'm just yeah. trying to move your money offshore. I should add the key input I haven't actually mentioned in terms of whatever Labor does is, as we've discussed, is the slowing of China. Mm. Uh, and uh, like I, I, I really think that the Chinese are not maybe, <laughs> almost certainly not on purpose, but they're going after iron ore. Yeah, okay. You know, I mean, in some ways it is on purpose, but the, the economic restructuring that they're undertaking is, is particularly negative for iron ore. Yep. So I think the base case is that we will have quite a nasty income shock through 2022 as iron ore falls. Falls. And it could really fall. Drag the dollar as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, very Look, good. I think it'll fall enough to drag the dollar. Mm. The question is, you know, does it, does it's it heading. fall to 100 bucks or does it fall to 50 mm. Mm. You know, I mean, 
because you've got Brazil coming in and, and other stuff. Yeah. Excellent. All right, thanks very much, gentlemen, for a great show. And thanks to you, Radic, a uh, terrific right. opening batting session there on Nucleus Investment Insights. And we hope to see a lot more of you uh, in future shows. So thanks for coming sure. along. We'll jump across to our viewer question of the week. Uh, and so what do you think will cause, uh, will the vaccine, vaccine issues cause a stock market stumble? Uh, your thoughts are always appreciated. Feel free to pop them into the YouTube chat. Always enjoy reading those uh, as well. Coming up next week, we're joined by our own Chief Economist, Leith Van Onselen, and property, our own property expert at the coalface, Catherine Cashmore, to take a look at the current state of the Australian property market uh, with record low home loan rates uh, and a reported post-pandemic resurgence in both owner-occupier and now investor interest in property nationwide. We thought it was a great time to bring in our experts to run through their thoughts on Australia's favourite asset class. Catherine is the President of the Tax Reform Think Tank Prosper Australia and Director of a respected real estate advocacy firm Cashmore & Co and always brings in some fantastic insights uh, from her hands-on experiences uh, with the Melbourne property market. So tune in next week Thursday the 22nd of April at 12.30pm for what promises to be a big show on a very hot market. Thanks again to all of those who've watched in for another great episode and to all of those who asked some terrific questions today i uh, hope you've taken away some great ideas and if you haven't already feel free to click like on the video to give us some feedback if you'd like to see more of our content head over to nucleuswealth.com forward slash content to stay up to date on news from us follow us on social media and finally if you know anyone who'd get something out of today's episode let them know about it share with a friend and help our show grow thanks again for tuning in from myself tim fuller and the team and we look forward to catching you with the next one cheers